hear me, if you can't see me at any point, please let me know. Let me know. How you all doing? Let me know in chat. How you all doing? Let me open up our own feed so I can hear myself and see myself. And then you're going to give them the latest news, right? Of course I'm going to give them. Later on. Later Of course. Of course, man. Not yet. Not yet. You got it? Yeah. All right. Let's get to this. Let's get to this. How you all doing? How you all doing? 737NG check ride talk. 737NG check ride talk. If you fly the 320 or the 73 Classic or you fly some other airplane, don't think this discussion is not for you. Um, this discussion is very much for you because a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here is applicable to all other types of different fleets. Rob Lewis, what's going on, brother? All good here in the UK? Good deal. Saludos desde Perú. Coronel Fernando. Saludos. Coronel Fernando. Dígame, dígame. Pleasure to have you all here. Appreciate you all being here. If at any point, please, you can't hear me, see me, or feel me, let me know in the chat, guys. Okay, so let's talk. Let's talk about this... Um, about this check ride, okay? I'm about to go, it's uh, 5.05, in two and a half hours at 7.30, I will be flying seat support on a check ride, and I wanna talk about what's coming on this check ride, how I'm gonna support the pilot flying on the check ride, what he's gonna be doing on the check ride, what are some of the gotchas I'm gonna be looking out for, okay? All these things I'm gonna be talking about. So the first thing is we're gonna start at the gate. I presume we're gonna be in Kennedy, uh, I'm not sure, but I would imagine we're probably going to be in Kennedy, and we're going to push back. He's going to do the whole setup. He's going to want to watch the pilot flying, okay, uh, do the FMS, right, Set, do all the flows, do the briefing, and we're going to push back. And the first thing that's going to happen on the pushback is we're going to have a hot start. We are going to have a hot start. Now, it could be a hot start, could be a hung start, could be a no EGT, uh, Whatever. It's going to be a start anomaly. Why? Because the Airman Certification Standard, ACS, says that we have to have a start abnormality. And, of course, the start anomaly that we're going to have is more than likely the hot start. That's almost always what it is. So what he's going to say, okay, the pilot flying is going to say, it, well, first he's going to do the memory item, engine start lever to cut off, right? He'll bring the start lever to cut off position. And then he's going to call for the aborted engine start checklist. Now, I'll be the pilot monitoring, so I'm going to do the aborted engine start checklist for him. I'm going to open it up. It's 7.1. Aborted engine start checklist condition during a ground start, and aborted engine start condition occurs. Step one, engine start lever to cut off. Cut off. Pilot flying already did that. Memory item is complete, and then I go into the choose one. Engine start switch is in ground, or it's not in ground. And it will be in ground, probably. So we're going to motor it for 60 seconds. Uh, that'll be my job to hit the timer for the 60 seconds, so I'm going to be timing this for the 60 seconds. And then once 60 seconds is up, start switch off, abort it, and just start checklist complete. Now the pilot flying will say, cockpit to ground. Now, for those of you that are not aware, there's, there's two different grounds we're talking about. When I say cockpit to ground, I'm talking to the tug driver. I'm not talking to ground control ATC. In fact, me as the pilot monitoring, I would be talking to air traffic control at this point. The pilot flying, the captain in this scenario right now, is going to be talking to the tug driver. So he'll say, cockpit to ground, yeah, go ahead. We had an impending hot start. The word impending means it almost happened. Not that it happened, it almost happened. Impending hot start. Uh, we're not going to have any temperature exceedance, hopefully, because he's going to cut it off in time. <clears throat> and and uh, at which point we're going to get maintenance on... The headset, right? So, uh, cockpit to ground, yeah, we had an impending hot start. Okay, maintenance is coming out. Maintenance will provide guidance, and they're going to say, go ahead and try the, uh, the engine start a second time. And if you don't have a successful start, you will, right? Uh, then we're going to take you back to the gate. So, they'll, they'll clear out. Ugh, the examiner will clear the fault. We'll start the engine again successfully. Uh, two good engine starts, cockpit to ground, go ahead. Yeah, we got two good engine starts. Okay, you're clear to disconnect. We'll show me the pin. So... They'll disconnect the tug. I'm going to do his before taxi flow. Generators, probe heat, anti-ice, hydraulics, reconfigure the pneumatics panel, put the start switches to the uh, continuous position, recall flaps. I'll do the whole flow. I'm going to, at that point, complete the before taxi 
checklist after the flow, call for taxi, and then we're going to begin taxiing out to what I presume is going to be 3 1 left. So in Kennedy, uh, they typically will launch you on 3 1 left. On the, uh, I think it's either the Canarsie climb or the Breezy Point climb. I think it's the, the, uh, the Canarsie climb. Anyway, it's a left turn because Manhattan's out here and there's obstruction. So climbing left turn, we go to the Canarsie VUR, frequency is 12.3. So we'll have that tuned up. Out of 400 feet on this takeoff, so it's a normal taxi, normal takeoff. Callouts will be standard Boeing. Okay, 400 feet, roll mode, it'll be LNAV, 1,000 feet, we're going to speed up, clean up, and then we're going to make this left turn in this direction, and on this heading, we typically start with the air work. Okay, now keep in mind, guys, for, for those of you watching, you're like, oh, here's the entire uh, check ride. This is pretty much the check ride I'm going through with you. This is typically the way I've seen it done. This is typically the way I train it and instruct it. It doesn't mean it's always going to go this way, because an examiner can do whatever he or she pleases, but typically... They have to hit, they have to check certain boxes and they have a confined amount of time to do it. And this is a very uh, efficient way to get it done, if you will. So we'll do the air work. What is the air work? We're going to do steep turns. We're going to do stalls. We're going to do unusual attitudes. Um, main things that I will be looking for on this air work, okay, is to call out any altitude deviation on the steep turn. The first thing to go on a steep turn is the altitude, almost always. When we do in these steep turns like this, the first, just so you understand the tolerances, it's airspeed plus or minus 10 knots, heading plus or minus 10 degrees, and altitude plus or minus 100 feet. So typically, when we roll into this deal, the first uh, item, metric, to go out of tolerance is altitude. And it's usually because the pitch is a little bit all over the place. And if you've seen our online programs, you would see probably my briefing video where I really hit on the fact that, number one, you want to roll slow, 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 slow. You want to roll super slow into the steep turn. And you're going to do your steep turn at 45 degrees of bank. Okay, so you'll have your 45 degree bank out here. The airplane will be saying bank angle, bank angle. Totally normal for it to be saying bank angle, by the way. And he'll be holding this 45 degree bank. I'll be watching his altitude and I hope likewise he'll be watching it. And the VSI is very telling, the vertical speed indicator. So I'm primarily looking in between two and a half and five degrees and the vertical speed indicator right over here. In level flight, prior to initiating the roll, the N1 is gonna be 60% approximately. And in the turn, the N1 is gonna be 65%. Now, um, the N1 value in the turn is typically 5% above what the level flight N1 was. So if in level flight we're 60, in the turn we're going to be at 65. If in level flight, let's say they loaded it up or a little bit heavier, uh, or a different scenario, instead of typically doing steep turns at 5,000, they, they take you to 10,000 to do it. Maybe your N1's a little bit higher. Maybe level flight you're 65 and then in the turn you're 70. But typically it's level flight plus 5 in the turn. So that's the the best thrust setting and I don't recommend I'm hesitant to give numbers like this because what I don't want guys and gals to do is to go reference from the attitude indicator to the N1 then back to the attitude indicator uh, this is just a ballpark and really what it equates to is tapping the thrust lever so when you start your turn you just tap the thrust lever you're gonna get five percent folks and remember what I said the main thing to be focused on here is altitude so I will be scanning altitude on this check ride and that's just hours away as we do the steep turn. Now the next thing is um, the stalls and the main issue with the stalls that we're looking to prevent is a secondary stick shaker. Okay, historically, traditionally, uh, the FAA was always saying we don't, we want to minimize altitude loss and they have shifted away from that thought. Now what they want is do not fly into a secondary stall. The way to ensure you do not fly into a secondary stall is, number one, if you have the flight path vector available, put the airplane symbol, the flight path vector, if you don't know, it's this little, those of you that are Airbus pilots, we call it the bird, okay? You're going to take the airplane symbol and you're going to position it on top of the flight path vector. You will never stall if you're flying exactly on the flight path vector because you're flying something called a zero lift line, which goes all into the extended envelope training EET course, which is part of our online programs. I have 
probably four hours where I talk about that there. But, but if you don't have the flight path vector, well, how do you make sure you don't do it then, Joe? Basically, what you could do, folks, is go down to the horizon and keep idle thrust. Okay? The reason people get in trouble on the stall is because of two things. Okay? Number one, the engines are mounted under the wing. Thrust application results in a significant nose-up tendency. And for people that come from GA background, they haven't flown anything bigger than a Cessna 172, uh, a, uh, a Seneca, a Duchess, light GA props, even a King Air. Or you fly some kind of corporate jet where the engines are mounted back here on the tail. The thrust application of a jet engine on a tail does not provide the same nose-up tendency that an underwing mounted engine does. So an underwing mounted engine thrust application, th these engines want to rip off the wing. But they're mounted very good, so instead of ripping off the wing, they stay hinged on, but the nose goes up fairly aggressively. So what happens to pilots is that they will recover with a lot of thrust, and then when the engines spool up, it drives them into a secondary stick shaker. So make sure when you recover, you bring the nose down to about the horizon, you smoothly come in with the thrust, and you keep, keep the aircraft symbol at the horizon. Even the two and a half degree bar is fine. But you have to hold it there. And, and don't get suckered into thinking that because the stick shaker stopped, you can bring the nose up. Listen to what I'm saying. Lower the nose to two and a half degrees or right to the horizon. Trim, 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 trim. Lots of trim. Why? Because the autopilot put a lot of nose up trim. It's up to you now to remove that trim and bring your nose back down. So you're going to have to lower this nose, go to the horizon, hold it there, trim, 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 to take out the trim that the autopilot put, smoothly come in with thrust, and only come in with thrust, as Airbus says, when the flight path has been recovered smoothly. In other words, don't look to recover from the stall with thrust. And, and I always further validate this point by asking, can you stall a glider? And of course the answer is yes, because a glider is an airfoil. A glider is, it has wings. And wings can be stalled. So if you can stall a glider, can you recover the glider from the stall? Yes, and a glider has no engine. So what I'm saying is you don't need an engine to recover from a stall. A stall recovery is a function of angle of attack, so lowering the nose and keeping the nose down is the main thing. Now, once you're down, one of the things that we're going to have to re do is recover the lost altitude, whether that's 300 feet, whether it's 600 feet, whether it's 1,000 feet. That's not the relevant part. What's relevant, remember, is not getting a secondary stick shaker, and then we're going to work our way back up to recover the altitude that we lost. So let's say we start this at 5,000 feet, which is very likely this is the altitude we're going to do it at. Uh, the, the stick shaker will come on in the clean configuration, because we're going to do three, clean departure and landing stall. In the clean configuration, stick shaker will sound somewhere in the neighborhood of 165 knots. Stick shaker sounds. Step one, autopilot off. Autopilot disconnect. Auto throttle's already disconnected. We're going to lower the nose down to the horizon. We're going to recover the flight path smoothly. We're going to level the wings if we had a bank, which we're not going to in this particular case. And we're going to smoothly come in with thrust. And the beauty of the NG is that we actually have a nice speed tape, right? Because this is actually more like a box. And we have a speed tape over here, and it's color-coded. And so basically, when you start working your way out of the amber cautionary band, that would be a nice time for you to begin uh, bringing your nose up to about 10 degrees to recover the lost altitude. So what this will look like in a profile view is we're going to lower the nose down to the horizon. We recover the flight path smoothly. The wings are leveled off, of course, because we've already been level. We have a little bit of thrust coming in cautiously because we don't want this nose to be too aggressive coming up. We've trimmed nose down, and then we smoothly start working our way back up here to this positive 10 degrees to recover the lost altitude, and we're going to go right back up to 5,000 feet. As long as you do this and you don't get a secondary stick shaker, you're home free. So what I'm going to be looking for is for the pilot flying to hold their nose down, recover smoothly, and not get too jumpy to want to bring the nose up. Okay, that's really what we're going to be looking for. Now, that's the clean stall. Uh, there's a, I have a whole, I won't go through all of it because I'm going to run out of time, but there's a briefing for the departure stall, which is flaps 5 gear up, and then there's a landing stall, which is flaps 30 gear down on a glide slope. All of that is on our online ground school, okay? So just visit our website, enroll if you haven't already, 
uh, and you'll see all of that there. So let's move on. So that's the clean stall. Now we're going to talk unusual attitudes, and then we'll move into the approach. By the way, if you guys have questions, Rob, what's going on? Tiago, hey Joe, thanks for keeping us motivated through such hard times. You really, truly motivated. I love motivating you, brother. Come on, man. Uh, leave your comments, your questions. If you want to call in, the phone number is 1-888-778-1441. It will ring right here. I'm waiting for your call if you want to talk to me. But you will be live. You will be on the microphone. Okay? So if that bothers you, maybe text. All right. Unusual attitudes. We're going to get two of them. Nose up, nose down. Nose up, nose down. And there's two, one of two ways this is going to happen. Either A, the examiner is going to program it from the back, or B, the examiner is going to tell me, hey, Joe, give the pilot flying an unusual attitude, nose up, nose down. Now, the first thing is uh, be nice to the pilot flying, man. There's no reason to flip the person upside down. And what you don't realize, for those of you that are oftentimes flying seat support and you are told to give the pilot flying, an unusual attitude. Simulators do not simulate GQs. What does that mean, Joe? What it means is if you turn and pull in an airplane, you would feel yourself being positively loaded into the seat. So you're going to feel yourself being pushed into the seat. Likewise, if you push forward, you do a little zero G maneuver, you would feel yourself coming up out of your seat, getting light in the seat. A simulator cannot simulate that because to simulate positive G's it would have to spin and of course it doesn't. So what's the danger then? Well the issue with that is that it's, it is possible to overstress the airframe if you don't feel the G's and particularly if you have a very high speed. So if, if you're in an unusual attitude where you're nosed down, way down here, okay, you're basically, my markers are running out, let me see if I have a better marker here. Okay, if your nose down, uh, let me see how I can draw this. That's going to be half decent. Like this, right? And you're accelerating like crazy. The second you try to recover from this, level the wings and smoothly bring the nose up, well, you have an airspeed that could be in excess of 300, 400 knots. Let's say 350, 350, 360. You're at VMMO, right? And over speed clicker, and if you pull too hard, you could actually overstress the airframe. And the, and the way the simulator is going to tell you that you overstressed it is that it's just going to freeze. <laughs> the sim will freeze. And of course, if you overstress it and the sim freezes, it's a failed check ride. So what I'm going to do when I give this candidate their unusual attitude is I'm going to make sure that I don't put them in a, that I don't set them up for failure. Okay? How? I'm going to bring the thrust levers back to idle. I'm going to get the 210 knots. Then I'm going to position the nose down. I'm going to go full thrust. You have control. The first thing they're going to do is autopilot, auto throttle off, thrust levers to idle. By the way, I just brought the thrust levers up. Now they're pulling them back. And as you know, in jet engines, it takes time for them to spool. So the engines never had time to spool. You understand what I'm saying? The second I gave it to him, it was literally he took control a half second after I gave it to him. So he brings the thrust levers back before the engines ever spool up, which means the acceleration that we're experiencing is not because of thrust. It is because the nose is pointed down. But because I started him at 210 knots, we've been nose pointed down, and he's going to be recovering. By the time he gets the nose going back up, we're probably going to be somewhere no more than 250 knots, which means he could pull all day long, and he's not going to overstress. So I'm not setting him up for failure. This is important. Those of you that are going to be seat support, you got to know you have to. This is why your, your support pilot is so important in the sim because they could be your best asset or they could just be an ass. Okay, which one do you want? You want the one that's going to help you. Okay, and I'm talking about, look, I'm, t I'm taking the, the term seat support and it's literal terms. You're supporting as best as you can, the pilot flying. This is what you need to do flying in real world, right? This is all CRM. I mean, obviously, we're, we're helping. We're being of assistance. So when we recover this, thrust levers to idle, level the wings, smoothly bring the nose up. We're going to recover back to the initial altitudes, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 feet, something like that. And we're going to do a nose up, unusual attitude. 
okay? And of course, all, all of this I talk about really, really detailed in our courses online. After we get through the unusual attitudes, we're going to move into shooting an approach. The first one's probably going to be an ILS approach. It'll be an ILS approach. I'm going to guess four right. Uh, the first setting up of the FMS will be by the pilot flying. The examiner wants to see you set up at least one approach. After that, pilot flying can delegate away to the pilot monitoring the setting up of the approach. So they could, like, they could at that point say, okay, Joe, set me up. At which point I go into my, my button pushing, okay? I have a live audience, by the way, in this live stream right now. So if you see me looking this way, well, that's two reasons. One, I have a screen where I'm watching your chat. And, and we have a live audience, which is a little bit different than normal, but we do. So if you want to do this, by the way, we're in Miami, Florida. Let me take some water because I'm drying out. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So ILS 4 right. We're going to do a go around out of this, probably. We'll go to a holding pattern. We've got to do a holding pattern entry. The airplane's going to do the whole thing. 400 feet LNAV. It's going to take us there. Fly the magenta. It's a beautiful thing. We'll speed up, clean up. We'll go in here. We'll make sure that we don't exceed... Uh, 200 knots in a hold below 6,000 feet. <clears throat> the hold is Deer Park, 4,000 feet. I've done this a couple times. We'll go out the DPK, 4,000 feet. Okay, trainer one, request speed relief in the hold. Approved as requested. Bingo. Now we're doing 210 in the hold, which is our flap up speed in the NG, roughly, depending upon weight, is our bug up. All right, we'll do this holding pattern. We'll go around, and then we'll probably come back in, shoot a non-precision approach, 2-2 two, two left, something like that. Probably going to be a VOR localizer or something like that. I, I, I personally would like to do LNAV VNAV on this approach, do the whole thing LNAV VNAV. Uh, it can be done with uh, Vorloke vertical speed, it can be done with LNAV vertical speed. I'm an advocate for using automation, LNAV VNAV is the way I would do it. So we'll do this approach however the pilot flying wants to do it, it's entirely up to them, it doesn't really matter to me. But, uh, and we'll land, okay we're going to land out of that approach. So now we'll move on, they're going to put us on the fours probably, four right, four left. The second they, oh, we're going to reposition you to four left, four right. That means engine failure is on the way. Why? Well, because when we took off a of 3-1 left, Manhattan was over here. Okay? So a straight-out departure is not going to work out very well. Now, you could have an engine failure, of course, and, and follow the, the standard instrument departure, the SID, and at 400 feet, you would just LNAV it, and you'd hang out this way, right? But typically depending on the examiner, they try to help you out and be able to get you a, a straight out uh, a departure. I gotta buy more markers, JD. We need more markers in the house! Can you guys see what I'm marking up on a whiteboard? Cause I'm standing six inches from it and it looks a little light. What do you think? Okay, so I just gotta put a little more pressure on it. I gotta put these muscles to work. I did biceps this morning. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so for right, they say Trainer one, we're going to reposition you four left, four right, and when they do this, like I said earlier, in Kennedy, these runways take us out over the water, which means engine work is coming, and the first thing we're probably going to do here is the rejected takeoff. Part of the PIC type rating, you got to do a rejected takeoff. So I'm going to expect for an engine to fail probably somewhere after 80 knots, but before V1, this is what's called the high speed regime. So from 0 to 80, low speed regime. From 80 to V1, high speed regime. So somewhere in that high speed between 80 to V1, we're going to probably have an engine failure, an engine fire. Something's going to go wrong. At which point, reject, he'll disconnect the auto throttle, bring the thrust levers back to idle, pull the speed brake out, go into reverse, I'm going to note the speed at which the reject uh, initiated, which we'll use later to go to the brake cooling schedule. I will be doing that. We'll bring the airplane to a stop. If it's a fire, we set the parking brake. Typically, if there's no fire, there's no brake. Reference your comp company material for this. All right, and then we'll call the flight attendants to stations, analyze the situation. What do we have? We got an engine fire. Okay, memory items for the fire, if it's a fire. If there is no memory items, no memory items, and we will consult the checklist, reference brake cooling schedule, and then typically at that point we get repositioned back and we will do the V1 cut. The V1 cut will happen. We'll fly this out. Hopefully they give us a four so we can request runway heading, and if not, no big deal. We'll just fly the SID. But if we can do runway heading, that always helps, particularly on an initial type rating. And then uh, we'll get vectored. Um depending on the engine left or right, right, we'll get vectored back and we're going to shoot a single engine ILS approach. Single engine ILS approach. 
Now, the single engine ILS approach will result in a single engine go around. 100%. We are going around on the first single engine approach. Did you get that live audience? Yes, sir. We're, yes, go sir. we're, we're going around on the first. We have to. It is required <laughs> to see a single engine go around. So brother and sister watching from the comfort of your home, hopefully you're sipping something warm and you're checking out JJ all day live in the 305. <laughs> JD's in the house over here. You will be going around on this first approach. So, two things. One, keep that in mind. Two, hand fly the first approach. The first single engine ILS should be hand flown. Why? Because when I initiate the go around, I have to push toga. When I push toga in the 737 Classic or NG or even the 200, the autopilot kicks off. So if the autopilot was on and you push toga, now you're left with the autopilot kicking off. So now you have to A, hand fly, B, silence the autopilot horn, reconnect tactilely with the airplane. That sounds official, right? And we got to put that correct rudder input to get us going away from planet Earth. So preferably, preferably you hand fly the first one so that you're, you've been connected with the airplane. The hand flying has to happen from the final approach fix inbound. So typically the last five miles of the approach. You get down to minimums, no contact, go around flaps one, you push toga, you smoothly track into the flight director, never above the flight director, never above the flight director for the third time, never above the flight director. Never above the flight director. Number one mistake, number one mistake. I see people do, they go above the flight director. What happens when I go above the flight director? Anybody in the chat, throw it in the chat. What happens when I go above the flight director? Okay, if you can tell me what happens when I go above the flight director, I'm going to send you a copy of my playbook for free, the ebook. I'll give you a few minutes to answer this. And if you've watched previous videos, you will know why I say never go above the flight director. This is the worst thing, the worst thing you can do on a single engine. Whether this is a V1 cut, whether it's a two engine approach, you go around the engine fails, or if it's a single engine approach, and you go around with the one engine. The worst thing you can do is go above the flight director, okay? All right, I'm going to answer it. I don't see any answers. Tiago. Oh, very nice. Very nice. I don't know if you have our playbook, Tiago. If you don't, um, hit the contact us tab. Shoot me an email, and I will send it to you. Speed falls below V2. Speed will fall. If you go up here above the flight director, your speed will decay. Now, if you don't know why that's a bad thing, let me share with you. Here's your aircraft, only this is a DC-10, but whatever, same concept. Aerodynamics are still the same. So we're, we're, we're rotating off, right? We're up here. The engine fails. Let's say number one engine fails. If I am pitched above the flight director, my speed drops off and my rudder loses effectiveness. So you could be flooring the rudder down to the floor and what's happening is because you have go-around thrust over here and a floored rudder, but you're so far high above the flight director that your airspeed has decayed so much, that yawing tendency couples to a roll because of the swept wing aerodynamics of a transport category jet. And now you end up rolling like this. And this, this is, this is probably one of the number one things I see uh, historically, when I was working before at a 142 training center, and they would call me up, Joe, they, I, I was the low-time pilot fixer-upper. Joe, we have a candidate here, a pilot, that has an issue with a single engine go-around. And I would always say, let me guess. No, 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 don't tell me what's wrong. Let me guess. They're going above the flight director. Well, yeah, let me read your file to his file to you. That he's going above the flight director. He forgot to call flaps one on the go around. So the procedural part was part of it, but almost always we're pitching above the flight director. So for maybe the fourth or fifth time, don't go above the flight director. You stay in it. And if you're one of these people that for some reason can't track it, then go below it. 
but don't go above it. At least below it, you got speed on your side. Speed on your side is, a, is an effective rudder, period. So now we do this go around, we stay in the flight director, we keep speed on our side, we come all the way back around, we shoot a second approach, this one will be to a landing, you're going to want to use the autopilot, second approach, autopilot on, why? Because when we get to minimums, we're going to have the approach lights in sight, and I'm going to say that, approach lights, and at that point the autopilot's still engaged, so pilot flying, I would advise you to leave the autopilot on, let your eyes adjust visually to the sight picture outside. And the, the reason for this is because what I don't want to see happen here is that when I announce it, you look outside and you unconsciously do one of two things. You either look out and pull, go back IMC, or you look out and you see it, but you want to see it a little bit better, you relax some pressure on the control column and now your nose dips down and you get a sink rate. Because remember, a three degree path is already a 750 foot per minute rate of descent on the ILS approach. So it's very easy to go below 1,000 feet per minute and you get sink rate. So we don't want to go IMC and have to go around and we don't want to get the sink rate. So leave the autopilot on and it'll keep you on the three degree glide path whilst you allow your eyes to adjust. Hey, if you're liking this live stream, guys, please subscribe to this channel. Leave us comments. Leave us even the critiques, man. I welcome the critiques. I go through and I read all of them. I know I got people on my channel. Joe said this and why would you do that? Because, brother, those are just my, my thoughts. Brother or sister, whoever you may be. Um, but su subscribe, leave comments, do all that stuff, man, please. And, by the way, we record this kind of stuff and shoot it out to your email all the time. So what I would recommend you do is go to our website and subscribe to the newsletter. There's a little box here that says, uh, take a look at our free content. Drop your email in there. You'll be getting content like this all the time. I give them the $95. All right, I'm coming, man. I'm coming, I'm coming. Let's wrap them up. So we're going to land on this second approach for the live audience. The autopilot's on. We're going to land, maybe do the evacuation, maybe do the evacuation checklist, okay, on this one. In fact, we probably will because we're basically at the end of the type right now. So we'll probably land here. We're going to have some kind of APU fire. Remember what I said about the parking brake. If you're on fire, set the brake. So we bring the airplane to a stop. If the fire happens at 500 feet on short final, silence the bell. This is what I'm going to do as a pilot monitor. I'm going to silence the fire warning, land the airplane, runway's right in front of us. Land the plane, bring it to a stop as soon as we can, uh, and then set the, park, set the uh, parking brake on, flight attendant stations, run the memory item, which is APU fire switch, pull, rotate, switch turns off. This, hopefully it goes out. If it doesn't, probably won't on a type right evacuation checklist. I'm going to go through the evacuation checklist, and then we're going to um, exit the aircraft. Typically, captain will go with the crash axe, walk the length of the airplane, be the last one out, and the pilot monitoring, in this case the first officer, not the pilot monitoring, the first officer, uh, will take the um, fire extinguisher and assist with the evacuation upwind of the aircraft uh, outside. Re I would also say consult your company manual on how they want you to handle that, but that's typically a standard procedure for handling an evacuation. So that's going to basically wrap up the type ride. We'll taxi back into the gate, do the after lane flow, taxi back into the gate, we'll shut it down, and hopefully we're going to hear, congratulations, you passed your type rating. JD's got the, uh, <laughs> he's got the, uh, the, the sunglasses on in the house, okay, because it's, because it's so, because it's so bright up in here. It really is. I got five lights in front of me. Okay, and, um, and that's it. Hopefully we're going to have a good type ride. So, look, all of this that I just talked about in like 35, 40 minutes, whatever it's been, this is a very surface review. We're going to cover this December 4th and 5th for two like days, that. for two days straight. Uh, Juan will be here. JD's going to be here. He's going to do the systems with you. Everything I just spoke to you about is not systems. We didn't talk systems. All I talked about was procedures, shooting approaches, some of the briefings, and the check ride profile. But we really hit the surface only. It's only the tip of the iceberg, as we like to say. And we didn't even talk about the systems, man. Uh, Juan is going to be here, JD, December 4th, to talk 737 systems with you. It will be live. Uh, it will be interactive. We're going to be on a Zoom call. It's a virtual Zoom call, so we can bring you in to the conversation. We'll be, we have a, a big 50-inch screen in front of us, so we'll have you here. We'll be interacting with you. You can talk to us, have your questions up. We'll be bringing schematics in and out, that kind of deal. Um, typically, this course, if you wanted to do like an hourly ground, it's 150 an hour. 
we're doing 16 hours. It's two days straight, long days, eight hours a day, airline style training. It's $97. If that's of interest for you for $97, uh, please go to onestepprep.com forward slash virtual. Onestepprep.com forward slash virtual. And I will be there uh, on day, I'm going to be there both days, but really on day two, I'm going to focus on automation with you guys. And I'm going to go through some things with this FMA, with this flight director, with the MCP, stuff that's just going to blow your mind, stuff that I've taught initial recurrent and upgrade ground school to, and pilots with 20,000 hours that have been flying this jet are like, man, I never knew that thrust hold meant that the thrust levers will be held at the last manually placed position. So we're going to expand on that December 4th and 5th. I hope to see you there. Those of you that are Airbus pilots, we're going to do the same thing. I fly the Airbus actively, if you don't know. I do fly the A320 actively. Uh, and we are going to be doing a live, same deal, virtual Zoom interactive on December, what, 18th and 19th? 18th and 19th. 18th and 19th. It's an early Christmas present. Okay, Merry Christmas. That's it. We're going to be doing that on December 18th and 19th. Two days, long days. It's eight hours a day. You're going to have to st stick it out with us here. 16 hours, 97 bucks. Uh, Lunch. No, we're just we're just giving it away. Well, listen. Oh, we should be going to jail for that. We should be going to prison. Okay. Look, it's nine. It's it, the reason it's ninety-seven is a couple of reasons. Okay. Number one, um, we typically we've never done a, a, a ground school online the way we're going to do it here, virtual, interactive with schematics and all that. But because of COVID, uh, number one, it's it's a lot safer, if you will, to do it online. It's a lot more accessible. It's a lot cheaper. Um, and we're just able to, to uh, bring the cost to a point where everybody can get in. And, you know, needless to say, unfortunately, our industry is getting hammered. So it probably helps a lot of people as well. Our industry, unfortunately, it's very saddening to see what's happening. And hopefully for just 97 bucks, we can, we can help people stay fresh. So there's, there's, there's two people that are typically out there right now. Well, maybe three, three pilots. There's the ones that are actively flying. There's the ones that are being displaced. I've gotten several phone calls. I was flying at United. I was flying at Delta. And I was at American. I was flying the 767, the triple, the 74. Uh, and I'm being displaced to the 737. These are pilots that never thought they were going to have to go back to the flight academy. They never thought they are going to have to go back to the training center to do a new type rating. I hear you, man. I hear you. It's brutal. Um, so we have that type of pilot right now. We have the ones that are on leaves that need to stay sharp, including me. I am one of those pilots on a leave. Uh, I fly again next year, January next year, so I have to stay sharp, right? And part of that is discipline, and part of that is having the right tools. So we want to bring the tools to you here, all on video. It's very simple, folks. You can literally just hit our, hit our videos, drink your coffee in the morning, and just watch a couple clips a day so that you stay sharp. Uh, and you can join us for this live deal. Uh, if you want to do this, onestepprep.com forward slash virtual. That's the 97 buck deal. And if you, if you want the online programs, just hit onestepprep.com. And, and of course, you'll have all the selection of our courses there. All right, let me check the chat real quick. Tiago, I see your email there. Uh, we will get, I'm going to get you that playbook that I promised you. Rob Lewis, thank you, bro. Top lesson. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate you being here. Ramon, awesome. Wish I knew pilots like I said. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you, Ramon. Appreciate it. Uh, Sanko, Joe, I like you. You're a great flight instructor. Thank you, Sanko. I appreciate it. Can I join a 320 virtual two-day class if uh, I only fly flight sim? Uh, uh, yes, Rob, you can. Absolutely. Uh, if you only fly flight simulator you would benefit greatly from it as well because we're going to go through systems and we're going to go through profiles as well. So um, these are dark times, brother. I, I hear you. It's just not only for our industry, like across the, whole, across the whole planet, man. It's just it's interesting times to say the least. But look, stay positive. Stay busy, guys. Stay busy. This is the number one thing. If you, if, maybe we should record like a day in our life type of video. If you saw... Every day, I'm like, I'm into one thing to the next thing to the next thing, and I'm busy, and I'm busy, and I'm busy. I'm, I'm actually afraid of boredom. Like, I, I know that sounds crazy, but 
boredom is the enemy. I'm fearful of being bored, man. So I'm like, I'm jumping around from a hundred different things because when you're sitting around doing nothing, you have too much time to think about stuff. So I need to be studying. I need to stay sharp. I need to be staying productive. I need something to occupy me. And uh, that's why we're always running around either recording, live streaming, I'm flying, I'm doing some other project with another website that I, whatever. I'm always trying to do something. Stay busy and stay positive, Rob. This is going to, this is all going to uh, go away at some point, probably sooner rather than later. So you can join it, and we'd love to have you there. What else we got? Any other questions? We'll probably wrap this up. It's a good 45-minute live stream. Um, I think that's about it. What else you got, JD? That's it? I think we're good, man. Hey, I appreciate you all being here. If you're in Miami, come by and see us. Come join us for the live... Uh, Crystal Palace. We're in the Crystal Palace. We're on the fifth floor, 5600 Northwest 36th Street. It's on our website, Suite 5000, on the fifth floor. Uh, you can come pull up a chair here and watch this live. You can come do some live training with us. Hope to see you in the December class, and I hope to see you enroll online in one of our programs. We're extremely available, folks. I cannot tell you how many emails I get from our members. Joe, you said this in this video at 13 minutes and 50 seconds. What did you mean by that? I will get back to you. Um, what we don't want is what is so prevalent in this industry, which is you show up for training, here's your manuals, here's your self-study, CBT tragedy, good luck. Ah, not like that. <laughs> CBT tragedy. You're on your own. Okay, this has happened to me so many times I can't even tell you. I'm like, man, I can't wait till I go to training and I finally sit down in front of an instructor. And then I get to training and I sit down in front of the instructor and the instructor basically says, hey, uh, Joe, can you tell me this? Can you tell me the flight control laws and what, can you tell me what you have, what protections in normal law? Joe, how come you didn't know that? Joe, can you tell me what's a, what do you have in direct law? And I'm sitting here thinking with a thought bubble, I'm like, dude, I thought that was your job to tell me these things. Like, I thought the instructor was supposed to educate, not examine. If you're on the email list, we just sent out an email that says, is your instructor educating or are they examining? So what we do here is instructor-led training, educating, not examining, okay? We will ask you things. We will assess progress. We will examine. But believe me, if I ask you about it, it's because I talk to you about it. Uh, and we really try to make an effort to lead, instructor-led training, lead with the instructor, not with the presentations, not with the boring PowerPoints. And a lot of, just by the way, guys, if you get an instructor that comes up and just clicks through a PowerPoint, you have to actually know 